Hi, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Welcome. If you can't hear me, uh, please just write in the chat box below and I'll try to assist you in any way that I can. But uh, we're ready to start. Uh, welcome all to the Adventure Talk series hosted by Hanover Adventure Tours. We're happy to have you all here tonight. And we have a large group. I think almost 50 people signed up, so super excited. Um, so tonight we have a special guest. It's uh, Paul Marcellini, and he is joining us to discuss North America's highest peak, which is Mount Denali in Alaska. And this is gonna be an interesting talk, really cool pictures, very in informative, and uh, I'm really excited for it. But uh, before we start, I do wanna tell you all a little bit about Hanover Adventure Tours. And uh, just cause we are hosting this and we will continue to host events just like this. So uh, first off, hi, my name's Jane, uh, Jane Trailer. And I am the marketing and tour manager here at Hanover Adventure Tours. Now, uh, I've been here for almost three years, and the company is about the same age. So I've watched this place grow, and it's been such a journey, and we're really excited to continue uh, for the years to come. So Hanover Adventure Tours. We work towards being the place in the upper valley for outdoor adventures. Uh, there's a lot that we do, and um, it's pretty exciting. So to start, we are located right along the Connecticut River on Route 5, only about three miles from the Ledyard Bridge. And we're an interesting concept, pretty much. Um, first off, with our building, uh, we have a bike shop and adventure center on one side. And then the other side is an adventure hostel. So if you're ever just stopping on by, it's always fun to just take a little tour because there's always something around the corner, pretty much. Um, but jumping into the bike shop and adventure center, to tell you a little bit about us, we're known pretty much for electric bikes. We uh, have about 15 different e-bike models here at the shop and over 70 to choose from if you're looking to go for a rental or say um, to purchase. So if anyone was ever interested, it's really cool to come along and see the different models. You know, it could be something from a cruiser if you're looking to just explore the upper valley or take the back roads, or you can go all the way into mountain riding uh, and look at the mountain bike. So if you do stop by, you know, one of our associates can explain a little bit about the bikes and you can learn about the different motors and a lot more. Um, but also we are a bike shop, so we service bikes. And so we service electric bikes or non-electric bikes. And we do know that spring's coming around the corner. It is time to start biking again. So if you do think about stopping by, um, we're more than happy to check out your bike too. So diving into the adventure part as well, um, we have a couple of things that we do. The first thing is rentals. So we have a couple of things and the first one's gonna be e-bikes. Uh, so it's really fun to take out one of the electric bikes and anytime you do that, you do have a bunch of different curated routes to choose from. So you can explore the upper valley or go under some covered bridges, see some beautiful views. Um, it's a whole lot of fun. Other things is, like I said, we're located right along the Connecticut River. So we have a dock right there and you can rent canoes, kayaks, um, paddle boards or tubes. So it's a whole lot of fun. And uh, knowing that it's the winter, we are open all season long and have some snowshoes and some fat tire e-bikes as well. So a little bit more is tours. So tours are in our name. So we do have a couple of tours to choose from. You can taste the upper valley with um, the brewery and distillery tour. Now you can take that on an e-bike, but we recommend the uh, private coach that we have as well. 
Um, or you can explore the Vermont Backroads and Farm Stand Tour where you learn the rich history of farming here in Vermont and you get to taste a couple of uh, goods from the farm stands, which is really fun. Um, last but not least is we do have an event space. So you can definitely come along here and, and rent something here on the field or say just uh, inside, but also we have events just like this one tonight with the Adventure Talk series. We did do this online, but sometimes we have it in house, which is lots of fun. But also during the summer, we try to have a summer party or say an e-bike day um, or even some community rides. So definitely stay tuned. There's always something going on and we just love being part of the community. Um, and the last thing is also we have um, a hostel. So it's really cool during the summer as we host a lot of Appalachian Trail through hikers. So they're coming in and coming out pretty quickly as they take their journey, but it's so much fun when you stop by and just like hang out by the fire pit and have some great stories and whatnot. But that's a little bit about us. Um, and we really work towards being with the community or being part of the community in any way. And that's why we do talks just like this um, we want to inform you all about, say, the Appalachian Trail or Mount Denali or other things like e-bikes. So, you know, as we continue to grow, we hope you get to know us and, and we get to see you guys come on by or just say hey. But um, other than that, um, I'm done talking and I uh, am really excited for Paul to talk tonight. Um, you know, Mount Denali is a very large mountain and there's so much cool information to learn. Um, and what's awesome is a lot of the medicine we may learn tonight um, is definitely going to be something that we can stay with ourselves if we decide to go hiking around here or say the White Mountains, which aren't too far. So i um, really excited. So I hope you all are ready. And um, let me find Paul in the amount of people that are on right now. Uh, one second. Paul, Paul, Paul. Almost oh, like there you go. I'm going to ask him to unmute and start the video. Hi, Paul. Hi, Jane. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Excited to have you here tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll pretty much what I'm going to do is get off here for a little bit and allow you, Paul, to, to start out and make sure you can share that screen. Um, everyone also, we're having our question and answers, our Q&A, um, going to be pretty much at the end. Um, but if you have any questions, I can see we see a lot of faces, but we'll mostly do the chat box to make it a bit easier. Um, but we'll see how things flow first. And other than that, uh, Paul, it's the stage is yours. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. And uh, I appreciate it. And thanks to Hanover Adventure Tools and Jane for uh, inviting me. So what I'm gonna talk about is uh, kind of four different things that break down with uh, Denali. First is to give you some information on Denali is one of our, one of the best in national parks I've ever spent time in. Look a little bit at the climbing community and the climbing, uh, uh, the climbers of Denali, along with the search and rescue that takes place. To take a look at some of the things that happen on Denali are actually things that can happen and do happen in the White Mountains medically. medically and to uh, talk a little bit about what, what is wilderness medicine? What is it really? So let's take a look at wilderness medicine. So wilderness medicine it has historically been defined by these uh, four points. So remote, remote or delayed access uh, to medical care, which should make sense to everyone. Hostile environment, limited equipment, limited resources, and communications. And interestingly, communications was never on this list until the last five, six, seven years uh, when the technology uh, kind of blossomed but it wasn't something we were that concerned with, which has now made the list as we go through it. So there's a variety of wilderness medical programs and who takes wilderness medical programs? Well, it tends to be outdoor professional as well as outdoor recreationalists. And the uh, 
types of programs that are available break down into the, these five, wilderness first aid, advanced first aid, first responder, EMS, and then uh, wilderness advanced life support, which is a course that's primarily for physicians, paramedics, nurses, BAs, um, folks that are already working. And it's not something that's just in the United States. Nationally, uh, internationally, there's a push for wilderness medical programs. And that picture on the right is, uh, some guides from the Serengeti and uh, from uh, Mount Kilimanjaro that a uh, course that I taught uh, a little while ago and they're actually doing a litter carry. So what's different between what we think of as traditional medicine and wilderness medicine? I think the biggest thing is uh, decision-making. You know, if someone has chest pain in Hanover, it's no different than having chest pain up on Denali, but what changes are a few factors that factor in with that decision making, critical thinking. First of all, when it you know you think of something in town here happening, an ambulance arrives, and you may go to Dartmouth Hitchcock, and you're there within an hour. It takes us at most uh, it takes us most times longer than an hour just to respond to where patients are in the mountains, and it also takes us more than that hour to have that we are taking care of patients before they're able to be uh, transferred away from us to that definitive care. So a lot of the decision-making is you're hanging on to patients longer and you're making decisions about how to evacuate them and how to expedite that evacuation back to uh, uh, a more definitive care. There are many companies that teach wilderness medicine uh, in the US. Um, but there's no specific oversight nationally. So each of these programs kind of develop on their own. And although the curriculum may be similar within the programs, what really makes the difference in terms of choosing a course for you is the quality of your experience in, in uh, the classroom or in uh, the courses, the instructor. There's a lot of variability in the instructors. Wilderness medicine is a combination of outdoor skills and medical skills. So if you're a great outdoor person, you may not have the medical experience to take care of folks. And the opposite is also true. You can be a medical provider that's stellar, but if you have no outdoor skills, you're not that helpful in a search and rescue situation. That tagline that's on the bottom of this slide is actually from a clothing company that uh, where I grew up near Buffalo, New York, um, an informed consumer is our best customer. And I think that applies to choosing a medical program or wilderness medical program for yourself, whether you're an outdoor professional or you're working uh, you know, in the outdoor recreation world. And so I think when we look at these instructors, there's a couple of things that I would suggest you could ask these different companies if you choose to take a program. What's the patient care experience of the instructor, in particular wilderness uh, patient care experience? Have they been on expedition or extended trips? And those are non-guided. And the reason we put non-guided in is typically when, I have, when I'm guiding and I have clients, um, they're not really making many decisions. They're part of some of the day-to-day -day stuff, but when it comes to issues of safety or traveling in, uh, uh, some uh, some inclement weather or do we need to turn around now? Those are all made by the guide. And so when we look at those kind of ex expeditions or extended trip experiences, we're looking for decision-making. So that's why that's in there is non-guided. What's their work experience? Do they have a job in the outdoors? Do they have a job working medically? Have they presented uh, regionally or nationally on wilderness medicine? And then lastly, what's their research experience? Have they been part of studies? Have they written papers? So those are things that I would suggest you look for or question of the instructors if you choose to take a course someplace. So Denali is an Athabasca name that means the high one. And it's been controversy for the last hundred years or about a hundred years over whether we call it Mount McKinley or we call it Denali. And then in 2015, the Secretary of the Interior declared that it will be called Denali moving forward. As far as the size of the park, it's uh, 9,400 plus miles, square miles, and that's bigger than the state of New Hampshire and bigger than the state of Vermont. Denali has a, a visitation of about 600,000 folks. And I'll talk about this again in a few minutes, but Denali's actually as a park is divided into two areas. There's the Northern District 
in the Southern District. In the Northern District is where most of the tourists actually go. That's where the majority of those 6, uh, 600,000 visits are. And you can get to the North area of the park by plane, by train, by car, or by bus, um, which is a little bit different uh, than the Southern District. And I'll talk about that in a minute. About 1,000 to 1,200 climbers per season. And the season is from the end of April through the first part of July. And actually, the end point of the season is determined by the condition of the glacier that the plains land on. So if it's a cold summer and the snow stays stable, the, the climbing uh, actually continue a little bit later than if it's uh, the glacier that the plains land on starts to, uh, to break up or be unstable. 17% of the park is uh, covered with glaciers and it's a little over 20,000 feet. So the southern part where the climbers leave from, um, the airport for climbers to head into the park is in beautiful downtown Tulki, really tiny town. Um, it, one of the most significant points in the town is actually the, the, uh, the airport there. There's several air taxis that will fly you in. If you're a tourist, they will fly you around an alley so you can take a look. Um, but that's where the climbers all leave from. This is a look from the hill above town of Talkeetna. And you can see on the left, Mount Foraker, Mount Hunter in the middle, and then Denali on the right. The ranger station uh, in uh, uh, Talkeetna in the South District does several things. One, it's an educational center for tourists as they come in. It's a place for climber registration. We actually do a program, a slideshow that goes over the route and talk about equipment to make sure that the climbers that are going in the mountain actually have what they need for them. Uh, it also serves as our incident command center. So if there's a search and rescue that's going on on top of the mountain, it's all coordinated through this, uh, through this center. It's named the Walter Harper Center. And Walter Harper um, was, uh, did the first ascent of Denali way back in 1913. And that's Walter down with uh, some of his crew uh, down in the right-hand corner. This is our pack out room that's in the back of that ranger station. So we run what we call patrols. Typically a patrol has five to six people in it with one person that's a primary medical provider when we go up. Um, and so we are packing out all our gear and getting things started. We go out for a month. And when we hit week three, another group will come in behind us. So we're constantly rotating these patrols from April through the first part of July to the upper part of the mountain to do medical care and rescue. So we're just loading up gear here. This is a picture of us putting gear into a plane. So we fly in, that's our commute to work. It's about a 45 minute flight to get into the mountain and notice that there are skis on the plane. This is a look at the route. So here's where you land at 7,200 feet. This is base camp. And then we head down a long hill. It's called Heartbreak Hill. And the name really doesn't have much significance till you're coming home and you realize as tired as you are, you still have one long slog to get up this hill. We wrap around, we wrap around and head past the, this crevasse field here and then head up the mountain. Um, behind this peak here is 11,000 feet. That's where climbers spend at least uh, two days and that's to help climatize. And then up to 14,000 camp from 14 to 17,000 and then up to the summit. You'll notice a dotted line that's here that's sort of a shortcut going across that. This is what it looks like um, flying in. So base camp would be down in the right corner here. You'd wrap around all these crevasses and head up and 11,000 is behind this peak here. That dotted line cuts through here. And I'll tell you that on a personal climb with my friend Tim, who's a Knowles instructor, we decided we weren't going to go all the way around everything. We're just going to cut through and that'll get us up on the mountain higher faster. That wasn't a great decision. It took us more than a day to work our way through that crevasse field. We ended up camping somewhere in here when we wanted to be up here. So lesson learned. 
It's a picture of the peak as we fly in. This is uh, uh, two pictures that look at base camp. The upper left corner is the landing strip for base camp. And you can see that there's a series of tents. Those are all climbers going up. National Park Service has a presence there. We generally have two people that are, are stationed there for a couple weeks during the season. Um, and uh, they rotate as well. So you're in for two weeks and then you're out working at the ranger station and you may rotate back in. Um, one of the interesting things is the planes that land there, you have no sense that you're actually descending like you would when you're in a, a commercial plane. You actually fly in at a high rate of speed until the ground comes up underneath you and then you land. And the same when taking off, the plane goes like crazy until the ground falls away underneath you and you're airborne. The picture on the lower right is a bunch of climbers. And the, we had a, a, about four days worth of heavy snow. And these are people that their trip is either done or they've decided that they're going to bail off their climb and head back out. And the motivation that you see in that picture is actually a bunch of people on skis that are packing down the landing area so planes can come in and head, uh, they can uh, fly back out and head to Talkeetna for uh, a pizza and a beer after their climb. These are two tents that are at base camp. The red one tends to have all of our rescue equipment, our food and some other gear in it. The white tent tends to be our communication tent. It also has our stove in it and some chairs so that we can do our cooking and things like that. As far as communication, we have three types that are there. We have National Park Service radio, we have cell phone, and we put up our own cell phone tower for the, uh, for the uh, season. And then we also monitor family service radios, which most of the expeditions are carrying. So that in, in that way, people can get a hold of us if they get into trouble. This is a look at Mount Forker. Mount Forker is seen pretty much the whole way up the West Buttress route. And there's a couple things you can notice in this picture. First down on the lower right, this is the trail that leads out from base camp. And I say trail and I use that term loosely because there are no trails like we think of in the North, Northeast with trail blazes and you know, uh, areas that are marked. You're on your own up there. And so you make your own trails. So that either means that you're following um, people that have put footsteps in front of you, or if you decide where they're going isn't where you want to go, you cut away from them and make your own trail up the mountain. Also in this picture, you can kind of see I caught an avalanche that was happening right there. So there's a big avalanche coming down off the face. And then the last thing to note in this picture is uh, the cloud formation that's here. And so cloud formation of that sort tends to help you predict weather. It's only a small slice of the total prediction. And so, you know, a good climbing team will, will watch temperatures, will not watch barometric pressure, will watch the uh, cloud formation to see if there's weather that's actually coming in and help them make decisions when they climb. This is a picture of that cloud formation that's a little bit more prominent. And so if you, uh, if you're into weather or watch weather, so this type, type of cloud formation tends to loosely say, we're gonna get some weather within the next 24 hours. And uh, how quickly it builds and how high it builds help you to determine, are we gonna sit still today and read a book? Or are we actually gonna go out and travel? When the rescue teams are at base camp, the five or six people on the team don't necessarily know each other. And so we spend one day um, sort of getting our systems together. So while everybody has crevasse res rescue experience, we all practice crevasse rescue together. And that's to rescue someone on our team if they bail into a, a crevasse or also to go after and rescue other climbers that are stopped. So this is kind of just getting us on the same sheet of music. The picture on the left is the mark here of this pole of this avalanche probe marks the edge of a crevasse. And so what we would typically do is the crevasse is only 20 to 30 feet deep. <clears throat> so we would go down and drop into that crevasse and practice self-rescue technique. Or the picture on the right is another tool that we have in the toolbox, which is practicing 
um, a mechanical advantage uh, system to, to haul someone out of that crevasse. When we travel, we're on skis, and there's two reasons that we're on skis. One is that it helps with weight distribution over the crevasses, so you're able to spread that weight out a little bit more than you would on, say, snowshoes. And the second is that it allows us to get home quick. When we're done with our patrol, we ended at 14,000 feet, and we can ski back out and get uh, leave midday, and we're back down to base camp that evening. It took us five days to get up, and we can get out in an afternoon. So that's another advantage of skis. If you look at uh, the way they're traveling, everyone has a sled and everyone has a pack. The advantage of working for national parks versus doing a personal trip is most of our food is flown into 14,000 feet where we're going to be uh, staying the majority of our time. So our sleds are not loaded all that much because all our food's going up. So what we're really carrying is food and stuff for our five days uh, heading up the hill, plus an additional three or four days worth of food in case we're pinned down by weather. So the sleds aren't loaded that much. And by contrast, if you look at this sled, it's pretty loaded. This is actually my wife, Evie. She's a physician at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And this is one of our trips up the mountain. This is a personal trip, so we're carrying everything we need with us, which is about 100 pounds or more worth of gear and food and fuel and things like that. And you can see that that sled's loaded. Also notice that she's on skis and we're roped together. When we camp there on, on the mountain, one of the biggest things about this mountain is the weather and the weather changes. So this is a picture where we've built snow walls around our tents. And that's just to keep the wind off us. So you've got a place to go to get out of the wind. And it also prevents any drifting from coming into our tents um, that might actually bury them or come close to putting a lot of snow in our tenting area. This is a picture I took of a group coming up to 11,000 feet. This is a guided group. The first big kind of difficult section or the first big grunt that you run into is coming up to 11,000. It's a, a long day um, and it's uh, really rewarding to finally reach 11 in part because you put a really heavy day in, but also because you're going to spend at least two days at 11 acclimatizing so your body can adjust to the altitude. This is our camp, <clears throat> excuse me, this is our camp at 11. Notice that we've built a a snow wall into the prevailing winds and actually those blocks that you see that we've cut to make that wall we've cut out of a trench in front of that big wall and the reason we do that is is the prevailing winds are coming up towards us and so as snow is blowing or with significant snowfall it will fill that trench in front of the wall before it starts to climb the wall so that we can keep snow out of uh our area and it also protects us a bit from the wind. So to talk a little bit about the medical camp at 14,000, and medical camp is not something the National Parks has coined, but it, uh, it, what climbers have essentially called it for the past few years. So in 81, it was a research camp um, and uh, it was used as an experimental laboratory for cold injury. 89, most of that research moved to the Himalayas because it, and it may not be intuitive, but the weather is actually a little bit more stable in the Himalayas than it is um, in, uh, in the Alaska range. Um, it's also a bit warmer in the Alaska range and you can, uh, or in the Himalayas, and you can actually um, get to altitude quicker. There's a good study that looked at frostbite injury and compared Denali to the Himalayas, and there's far more frostbite injury actually on Denali than there is in the Himalayas. So in 1990, National Park System dedicated uh, uh, 14 uh, patrols. So that's when we first started, National Parks being the we, first started putting patrols of uh, search and rescue folks as well as medical folks on the mountain to deal with some of the uh, accidents and incidents that we see in the upper part of the mountain. National Park Service has a dedicated uh, rescue helicopter on Denali, but it also has dedicated helicopters in many of the other parks. We're near, for an example, the Tetons, another example, um, 
Grand Canyon would be another example. And those helicopters are there for just the season. Um, so what uh, happens is they're short term. So our helicopter contract actually runs from April through uh, first part of August. And uh, that's available for us for um, evacuation of any significantly injured or ill people. The cost of search and rescue is 5 million um, from the 2017, which is the most current figures available. What I find interesting as you read down through this is 40% of the search and uh, rescue is for hikers. And if you look down that list, one of the surprising things on it is the Statue of Liberty. And what they see primarily are strains and sprains from simple falls. But when we think of search and rescue, we tend to think of sort of these grandiose things on Rainier or Denali or in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And actually the largest percentage are pretty simple injuries in terms of treating medically and are at some of our parks that are very easily accessed. Less than 1.8% of the funding uh, for search and rescue actually goes to mountaineering. Although mountaineering tends to, the mountaineering accidents tend to, to be the ones that get captured in the media, particularly at Rainier um, because it's uh, proximity to Seattle. This is a paper that looked at the mountaineering uh, medical events and trauma events. And so if you look at the list, frostbite is our number one. And that's serious frostbite or full thickness frostbite. That's not the frost nip that people have when they go skiing. This is uh, stuff that needs a medical intervention. And then the AMS is acute mountain sickness. The HAPE is high altitude pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the lungs and high altitude cerebral edema, which is fluid on the brain or swelling of the brain. And then if you read down the rest of the list, that's actually things that you could find here in the Northeast on uh, any long uh, uh, um, sort of hiking trip, um, you're out for a week and those are things that you all, you all would, would see. So within the curriculum development of the wilderness medical courses, no matter who you take a course from, they will probably cover everything that's on this list. This is a look at where things happen on Denali. And you can see 14,000 catches 70, a little over 70% of all the medical and, and uh, uh, events that go on. Um, and then down on the bottom, what I find is really interesting is the self-rescue. So the majority of people actually self-rescue. And those, this is self-rescue after treatment. So they show up in our medical tent, we take care of them and we get them spun up enough that they can head out the door and actually head down on their own. One thing that the National Parks does, and I think is pretty cool, is we have a program with Nepal where we bring over Nepalese climbers. Um, and what they do is they work with us and then primarily we work with training them on medical care and rescue care. And these guys are pretty accomplished. This guy right here, Mima, has actually summited uh, Everest 12 times. I put this slide in just to show a little bit about how Denali uh, is being affected by climate change. So when I first started going into the Alaska range, you would never see the amount of rockfall that you see here. And so via climate change, we're seeing a lot more freeze-thaw events. And so we're seeing a lot more rock come down. There was actually a climber on a guided climb that was killed several years ago by rockfall. This is our helicopter bringing up a load to 14,000. So camp's not quite set up yet, um, but they'll haul all of our gear up. So they, we end up doing supplies and resupplies uh, coming up with equipment. Resupplies are not necessarily happening unless we've sent for an evacuation. So it's not like we call and say, we need more of this or that or the other thing and it shows up. Um, there's a risk at flying at high altitude. And so here we've got a helicopter landing with a bunch of our equipment. This is my friend, Joe. He's dug through all of the equipment and come up with one of the most important pieces of equipment at 14,000 and that's our French press. Because of the amount of snow that happens away from the climbing season, 
um, we get a lot of thaw during the climbing season. So what we've done is put um, sheets of plywood down so that we have a level floor and so that our tent doesn't sink down too much as uh, the melt occurs that, that it, uh, happens during the season. If you look here, this is a piece of pipe that's 20 feet high, high about four inches in diameter that we take the plywood and other things that are going to remain uh, through the winter uh, and secure them to that pole. One of the questions that I've been asked is why don't we just use GPS uh, to locate it as opposed to putting this 20 foot pole in the air and tying stuff to it. And the reason is the glacier moves. So if we were to take a GPS location on where we stash that gear, coming up next season, it may or may not be there because it's going to travel four or five feet as the glacier moves throughout uh, the season. So even though it's a pretty simple thing to do and we've been doing it for years, it's probably the most efficient way to locate gear. And I've been up there and I've dug a hole upwards of 10 feet down to get to the gear that we last uh, we left the season before. So there is a lot of snowfall that occurs. This is a look at <coughs> the, our medical camp at 14,000. So we've got tents that we stay in here. So we're camping out, as you know it, to be no different than in, in Northeast in terms of winter camping. The blue tent in the middle is our cook tent. So that has a propane stove in it, a couple chairs in it, and a lot of our food supplies. Those cases that you see around the blue tent are also uh, filled with uh, food um, that is obviously frozen. The tent on the right is our communication tent, and so it works the same way as the tent at base camp. So it has National Parks radio, it has a cell phone, and it has family service radio. We use uh, um, solar energy to power those. The tent that's straight away in the back is our medical tent. And these tents change about every two years, and you'll see as I go through some of the pictures, that there's different tents in, in different situations. And part of the reason is the UV up there just destroys the nylon on the tents. And so the tents last a year, last a couple of years and then need to be replaced. As far as medical care on the mountain, we deal with primarily critical care patients only. So folks that, that I see either on the hill or that come into the medical tent are critical patients. Most common comp complaint is headache, and headache is sort of the on-ramp to all of the uh, altitude-related illnesses that can occur. Frostbite and acute mountain sickness are, are the, the two things that I deal with the most. And our goal is not to treat these patients and make them better so they can, can continue their climb, but actually make them well enough so that they can descend and go off the mountain. And people will... I've had times where people have come into the tent and I've told them that this is the goal. I'm happy to treat them, I'm happy to take care of them, but that means that their trip is over and they've turned around and walked away. I've also had patients that have walked away and then showed up the next day because they realized they're so sick that they actually need to be treated. So we have a medical tent. And it, as I said, this looks a little different than the one I showed you before. It's because the other one had been replaced. And this is where we're doing all of our medical care. So you can see that it's not all that refined. It's pretty basic stuff. Um, and we have a place for a patient to lie down and then we've got our supplies there. So this would be what the interior of the medical tent looks like in terms of a place for to work on a patient or for a patient to be um, um, in, in with us. Also notice that we have over here a propane heater. So on a good day, if all the stars align, I can get it up to about 40 degrees in that tent. So the temperatures in April get as low as 30 or 40 below Fahrenheit. So it, it adds some, uh, you know, the hostile environment that I talked about before in wilderness medicine. Uh, this is it. This is a look at our medical supplies. So we have different drawers for different things. So this is all of our airways stuff. This is all of our oxygenation stuff. What's not pictured in there is a Coleman cool cooler that we have. And it seems odd to have a cooler on Denali, but we actually use it for insulation. All of the medications that are liquid form or all of our IV fluids would freeze unless we put them in the cooler with hot water bottles to keep the temperature regulated within there. 
So part of the job of the medical person is to make sure that the temperature within the cooler stays such that we can keep our fluids and our medications warm. So let's bring it back home a little bit. So this is an article that talked about dangerous hikes. And I'll tell you that I've got it on Washington. And one of the things that's similar to Denali is the way the weather comes in and just how cold and windy it can be. So one of the accolades to Mount Washington is it's one of the more dangerous hikes in America, particularly during the winter. This book took a look at all of the accidents and incidents that took place on uh, Mount Washington. And so there's been a total of 161 deaths. So when they looked at causation, natural causes, trauma, hypothermia, and avalanche death were the ones that came to the top. Natural causes tended to be cardiac arrests. And in New Hampshire, fishing game does about 200 rescues a year. A couple headlines from last winter. The top paper there is a study of recreational injuries that were treated in, the in emergency departments. One of the problems that we have is that there's no good depository for the types or the numbers of accident incidents in the backcountry. A lot of them go unreported unless an agency of one type or another is involved. So we don't have a good picture on exactly what we see. But one of the things that came out of this article is what well as one of the ones from Sweden looked at what type of injuries are the most prominent um, for those in, uh, in outdoor recreation. And it uh, clearly comes to the top is orthopedic injuries at about 50%. And those are sprains and strains and fractures. So those are the things that we most typically see. Those are the things that outdoor programs more most typically see as well. And then with COVID, one of the things that you all I'm sure are aware of is we've seen sort of an influx of people going into the rural areas and going into the mountains. And this article talked about uh, the number of injuries that increased. And down at the bottom, you can see that uh, my friends at Acadia National Park, where I do some uh, teaching in medicine and rescue have uh, seen an increase of about 65% of the incidents uh, that they would typically see a 65% increase with COVID. So what kind of things are in common between say Mount Washington and Denali? So frostbite injuries at the top. So typically we don't treat frostbite in the field. If you can evacuate the person to definitive care within 24 hours. So Mount Washington would fit that profile. Baxter State Park and Rainier where I also teach some medicine and rescue we put together the same protocol. On those mountains, you can typically get off them in 24 hours. If you can't, then you're stuck rewarming. But on Denali, we rewarm everything. Getting off in 24 hours is just usually not an option. So we rewarm all of our frostbite. Orthopedic injuries as being one of the primary injury patterns in backcountry medicine, wilderness medicine, both on the recreation side and on uh, the outdoor professional side fits in, trauma from falls, GIGU, cardiac blisters, and you can read through it. The outlier on this list is altitude illness. And that's, uh, you know, Mount Washington just isn't high enough to have any of that happen, which is one of the things that we do see pretty routinely on Denali. So let's take a look at a couple cases from Denali. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one of frostbite and then hape and haze. So a guy in the upper left-hand corner is Romanian. He was a solo climber. Um, he had summited and was on his way back down and came across another solo climber that was laying in the snow that said he was too fatigued to move. So this guy actually spent a night um, with uh, the other climber uh, until they could actually yell um, in the morning when someone else was headed up the mountain to actually start to, to get a response from, a, from us in the national parks. Like most wilderness medical problems, medical problems, there's a decision-making component to it where the patient tends to either make a bad decision or doesn't have enough information or enough experience to make the right decision. And so what you see in that picture where the tip of his nose is black, 
that's going to, that's dead tissue that's going to be amputated at some point. And you can see both of his cheeks are also pretty frostbitten with some patches of, of uh, black skin in there. The decision making for him was he did not have a balaclava with him and he did not have a face mask. And out of the goodness of his heart, he stayed with someone else. And he ended up, when it was all said and done, of having more injury than the person that was said they were too fatigued to come off. The bottom picture is a guy from uh, Vancouver who started, uh, went out in the morning, his feet were tingly, he felt they were really cold, and then the tingling stopped, and he never bothered to stop and take a look at his feet. And so when he presented to me, you can see that he's got some black along his big toe, which is skin that's gonna need to be removed. And you can see a pretty significant line where the frostbite has affected all of his toes. And you might be able to pu pull out of the picture that there are several blisters that are on there, which is also a fairly ominous sign um, with frostbite injury, more so when they're filled with uh, blood tinged uh, fluid than they are with clear fluid like he has. But he ended up getting both feet uh, uh, with frostbite injury. And when it was all said and done, he lost seven toes. So the way we begin to treat that, and so since this isn't really a medical talk, I'm just gonna sort of superficially go through what some of our treatment and the first is the reverse the shell core effect and what a shell core effect is that you're really not going to rewarm these frozen feet unless you rewarm the core temperature or the core of the person first so we first thing we do is start to warm the person before we even treat the frostbite and then we rewarm by immersion uh rewarm at 39c or 102 degrees and then after it's rewarmed, there can be no trauma and you need to avoid refreezing. So trauma would be as simply as this person, if I rewarmed their feet on the bottom picture and uh, sent him out, hiking back out or skiing back out would be trauma and that would exacerbate the injury. So when I rewarm that foot, he's now committed to a helicopter flight out. We treat with ibuprofen. Um, which isn't used for pain control here. It's used uh, because of its inflammatory uh, capability. So we're reducing the inflammation. Opioids uh, for pain control, when you rewarm someone, it's, it's uh, significantly painful for them. So I use opioids with that. Aggressive rehydration. The reason that's there is the on-ramp to frostbite injury is dehydration. And so what we're going to do, and, and most of the folks that present as well as most climbers are running somewhere along that line of dehydration. And that in part is that they don't wanna necessarily stop and hydrate and because they need to melt snow uh, to get the water to rehydrate. So they're a little bit low uh, when they typically show up. Climbers tend to be hydrated in the morning um, and then they climb throughout the day and they don't really rehydrate fully until the evening again. So that period of time in between is when they're more susceptible to frostbite injury. Down under hospital care, TPA is a drug that's used to essentially break clots up or melt clots. And it's used primarily in a hospital setting for cardiac and for stroke patients. It's also used to treat frostbite. The studies that uh, essentially proved this came out of the University of Utah. Um, and the disadvantage of this is it's not a medicine that we can give um, orally or by IV. It needs to be given through a catheter in the bloodstream. And they float the catheter down to the point where the obstruction is, where those clots are formed that are creating the frostbite. And then they deploy the TPA to break that clot down. In Europe, they're using a different drug, prostacycline, along with ASA is aspirin and TPA. And those will help to uh, break down that clot formation as well so that hopefully we can increase blood flow and um, uh, increase blood flow to limit the amount of uh, um, damage that's been done. HAPE is pulmonary edema, high altitude pulmonary edema. And the, the treatment for that is rest and then consider descent. And both with pulmonary edema and cerebral edema, that descent is back to where you were well. So dropping down to an altitude where you were okay. Oxygen, acetazolamide is a medication that helps change your pH, which is part of the problem at altitude. A B agonist would be albuterol, which you probably all are familiar with. Then we consider nifedipine 
Nifedipine um, works with uh, pulmonary hypertension or works on pulmonary hypertension. 5-PDE, you may know as a erectile dysfunction drug. So 5-PDE also works at altitude. And so if you uh, read some articles on it, what they would say is the pharmaceutical companies developed it for pulmonary hypertension and found that it actually worked as a erectile dysfunction, uh, dysfunction as well, spoke to their marketing departments and decided they could make more money on erectile dysfunction promotion versus pulmonary hypertension. And so there you go. The picture on the left is a hyperbaric bag. So it's another way to combat that pulmonary edema or altitude sickness. And so the patient would be put in the bag and it's a sealed vessel. This is a foot uh, pump. So we can increase the pressure in the vessel. It has a constant one-way valve that leaks air out. So it continually needs to pump, be pumped up. The reason it leaks is so that we can control the airflow in there and add oxygen and get rid of CO2. This is a little window where you can view the patient. And typically by protocol, we would keep someone in a hyperbaric bag for about two hours. While they're in the bag, because the pressure within inside the bag actually goes up, the barometric pressure, it tricks the body into thinking it's at a lower altitude. So you'll see some recovery from symptoms with them in the bag. While they're in there, what we're doing is preparing them preparing their equipment. And once we take them out of the bag, we're gonna immediately descend. And for us, it's back down to 11,000 feet. And so we can get rid of the symptoms that way. So there's a correlation between ambient barometric pressure and altitude. Cerebral edema. So it's a fluid or swelling of the brain, rest day, consider descent back to where you were well. Oxygens, NSAIDs would be ibuprofen, acetazolamide again, and then dexamethasone, which is a steroid that works well for swelling of the brain, particularly at altitude, and then a hyperbaric bag in a similar fashion. Denali is a microcosm of the rest of the world up there during the summer, and you have people that uh, begin relationships, break up relationships, you name the medical problem and it's there. And unfortunately, we see them all. And this is a, a person with a behavioral medical problem. And this gentleman has uh, decided he was going to parasail off the summit of Denali as a way to kill himself. We were aware of him coming up the mountain. And so I met him at 14,000. It took a better part of an afternoon to get all of the sharp items he had, his ice axe and his crampons, and getting him to give them to us. Originally, when he arrived, he said that if we had interfered with his plan that he was going to uh, harm us as well. We uh, put him on 24 hour watch and rotated uh, those on our team in to make sure that he stayed safe and to make sure that we knew where he was and where it was going. At the end of three days, I convinced him that he should probably leave the mountain and he was willing to do that, but unwilling to travel back down. So we set up an air evacuation with him. I convinced him that he needed to be treated as any other medical patient. So he's on a backboard and he's got a cervical collar on and he's immobilized that way. We ended up using an aircraft for the National Guard, which we've got a, a relationship with in search and rescue in Alaska. And in part, it was because we were concerned of putting him in our small aircraft. And if he was going to try to kill himself, what would he do in our aircraft? So we put him in a larger aircraft and we had a law enforcement also with us. He thought we were flying to Talkeet and we ended up going to uh, Fairbanks. He was met by state police in Fairbanks and transported to hospital um, and spent a couple weeks in their uh, behavioral health, uh, uh, in a behavioral health setting until he was finally released. His family was so happy that we intervened in the way that we did that uh, they actually sent us a letter and were willing to buy us all chainsaws. And they were from Pennsylvania. And I think their thought was national parks, trees, chainsaws, where realistically on Denali, there's not a tree other than 100 miles of where we are. But I think it's the thought that counts. This is a look at going up the mountain with 14,000 feet. Uh, I'm sorry, at 16,000 feet, there's a ridge that you cross. And from 16,000, if you look back down to 14, this is the medical camp. 
that I showed you earlier at 14. And you can see that there's other areas and walls that people have built uh, on their climb up the camp, up uh, the mountain. This is a look from 17,000. This is the camping area or the area where people stay at 17 and you can see by the walls and the snow on the ground that is a really barren place. It's a really cold, windy place and it's not some place that's uh, much fun to stay. We tend to split our groups at 14 and we'll come up and stay for a few days at 17 and then we'll go back down to 14 and the next group will come up. And the reason we do that is to climatize ourselves so that if we have to go towards the summit, um, we're not gonna get altitude sick. It's also a nice flat landing area. And it's one of the areas our helicopter will, uh, will land in if we need to put a patient internally into the aircraft to fly them out. This I took out of the door on my tent around midnight. You can see that the sun is still up. So just it's a reminder that, you know, in Alaska during the summer, it doesn't get dark. And so we're able to do search and rescue without the use of headlamps. This is our helicopter. It's a high, alti high altitude helicopter, an A-Star B3 that's pretty stripped down. So we've taken weight wise, everything out of the aircraft that we can, so it can go to the higher reaches of the mountain. And we're setting up to do a rescue uh, here. Over on the left, this picture that's on the book, the helicopter has a rope coming down and the rope will connect to the patient who's in a canvas bag for transport off the mountain. We have landing zones where we can set the aircraft down at base camp and at 14 and 17. And we're one of the only programs with a loading, side loading Bowman bag. Bowman bag is the canvas bag that the patient goes into. And so medically what you need to do is have all of the work done on the patient prior to doing the uh, pickup by the helicopter. Because once you're airborne uh, at the end of that rope, there's no way to do any medical care. We put the patient in a side loading bag as opposed to on their back, because if they were on their back and vomited, then we would have some airway concerns. So we load them on their side so that we've got the best ability or they have the best ability to clear their own airway as they go, uh, as they're, they're, they're taken off the mountain. We tend to do long short hauls. So the sequence of a rope under a helicopter with a patient and a ranger underneath tends to be a short hop typically where you can get to a point that's flat that you can put the patient inside the aircraft. When we do pickups off, off the mountain, we tend to head either to 14, <coughs> excuse me, or all the way down to base camp. So we tend to do longer short hauls. We have a fuel bladder that's at our base camp. So the aircraft, if it's called, can come in light on fuel weight from Talkeetna, can do the rescue on the upper parts of the mountain, and then descend back to base camp and refuel for the flight out to Talkeetna. Medically, we work off a set of standardized protocols that are, are part of the National Park System protocols and procedures, but each medical director for each of the national parks has the ability to modify them. So for us, as an example, we carry altitude medicines and we use them up on Denali where they would be pretty useless to have in the Grand Canyon, where the Grand Canyon has a lot of heat related illness, which really doesn't fit into ours. So we've got a standardized set of protocols. Those protocols are used for all providers. So whether you're a paramedic, a physician, a nurse, or a PA, you're working off the same set of guidelines. Um, and then those are adjusted based on the park itself locally. I usually get asked somewhere along the line, well, how did you start to do this or how can I do this? And I'll tell you that I began by uh, working as a volunteer. So a volunteer in the parks program, every national park has one and it's a variety of things. It's just not rescue or medical, it's also trail uh, construction and maintenance. It can be educational programs. And the whole goal of this is that it benefits both the national park as well as those that volunteer in the park. Those that want to come and do medicine on Denali um, through the VIP program, there's some stipulations that go with that. So they need to meet the minimum qualification of mountaineering patrols. And I'll show you what those are in just a second. But they need to have at least three years of, of patient care, professional patient care experience, be proficient at a paramedic level. The reason we put that in is for, primarily for airway management. 
we will put uh, we will intubate patients and put breathing tube down or do surgical airways if necessary. And that's not typically something that's in the skill set for nurses and PAs, depending on what department they work in and who they work for. So our expectation is that everyone coming up um, will have at least paramedic skills. And it's something that routinely fits in the skill set of emergency uh, department physicians. These are the qualifications for being part of um, one of the uh, uh, patrols that go up. So national registry, so nationally recognized DMT license plus wilderness medicine, helicopter safety, avalanche, glacier train, glacier travel experience, winter camping experience, altitude experience, technical rescue experience, and then a climbing resume um, that includes Arctic experience because that's what we're really talking about. So the medical providers need to have all of those. Those folks that are coming up to be part of our patrol that aren't necessarily doing the, the primary medical care job need to have the ones that are in the checklist. This is a look of heading out, uh, going further up the mountain. This is 17 camp right here. So this group is, our, we're on our way up towards the summit now. Also working our way up towards the summit, what you can see in this picture is a small bamboo wand. So typically we place bamboo wands on the upper parts of the mountain um, so that we can make sure of finding our way back down. So that's there in case we end up in a whiteout or we end up in some fog, just so we have better visibility, visibility on the way we came up so that we can find our way down. Working towards the summit. And then on the summit, this is Scott. Scott's a, a ranger from uh, Canada who actually does a lot of work on Mount Logan. Thanks a lot, and uh, I'll work with Jane to answer any questions that you might have. If you have questions and they're not uh, or, uh, covered or you can't stick around, email me. I'm happy to answer any questions that you would have. Thank you, Paul. That was, that was amazing, honestly, very in informative. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Jane. Yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, so, guys, we're going to go through um, a couple of questions. If you have any questions, we're going to mostly um, use the chat box down below. Um, it'll just be a little bit easier just because I think we have about, like, uh, 30 people on right now. So, let's see. And I saw here that Peter had mentioned, I guess he read the reports for – the fish and game and uh, New Hampshire's fish and game and the typical hiking injury requiring rescue seems to be the lower limb for older hikers while, oh, hold on, just lost it, uh, while, while descending. Yeah, it tends to be when you, when you break down the classification of lower leg injuries, statistically it tends to be ankle injuries. Although I think personally from the search and rescue team that uh, my wife and I work with, I also see knee injuries that are in there. But it, the most typical of the lower extremity injuries from the data is uh, actually ankle injuries. Yeah, even for me, I, I hiked the Appalachian Trail and and I was told, you know, if you're going to be going downhill with all that weight, you're probably going to have knee problems. And I, I hurt my knees and definitely rolled my ankles a couple times. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess we have here from Natalie um, suggestions on how to prepare ahead of time for backpacking at altitude, say in the Sierras. So uh, thanks, Natalie. So um, in terms of preparing, I think, you know, altitude affects each of us differently. And so some people do really well at altitude and some not as well. And it also can be that you do have done well the last couple of times that you've been at altitude and you go on a trip and it seems to affect you more. It really comes down to genetics. And so what you're what your, your body looks like will help you to do that. So for Denali, as an example, what a lot of climbers do that are coming there will train on something that is less technical 
like Kilimanjaro, which is at around 19,000 plus feet. So you, you go and experience it that way. One of the other things that affects altitude is your fitness. There was a funny study that came out a while ago that looked many years ago now that looked at those that are highly trained and those folks that didn't train so much that went to altitude. And what came out of the study was the folks that were not trained as well, didn't do as much training prior to going to altitude, were less likely to get uh, altitude illness. But when you dig down into the, uh, the data, what actually showed was the reason the fit people got altitude sick was they were moving so much faster. So their body was acclimatizing less going up than those that didn't. I think the way to the best way to anticipate altitude problems is to look at what your itinerary is when you're going up to altitude and to go high and, and, and introduce your body to a couple thousand feet, uh, 3000 feet of al new altitude each day. You know, there's an adage that uh, climb high, sleep low. So when I mentioned that at 11,000 feet, we spend a couple days there before we head up. We spend two days. But on that, quote, rest day, when we're not actually moving, we climb to 15,000 or 16,000 um, just to get our bodies introduced to that new altitude and then come back down uh, to uh, 11 uh, just to sleep. So we're not going all the way to 14. We're staying less than 14. And from 14, it's the going to 16 and coming back down. So we're introducing the new altitude where you will become sick a little bit more gradually. And that gives your body time to, uh, to adjust. There's also some stuff within the studies that talks about um, you end up at when you're going to a high altitude or a new altitude, you end up with some pretty restless sleeping. And so that contributes to potentially can contribute to some altitude illness. So addressing your itinerary again. The guided groups, by example, take six, sometimes seven days to get to 14,000 feet because they're moving slower to give folks time to acclimatize. As rangers, most of us are used to working at altitude. So we have the ability or feel we have the ability to go to 14 pretty quick. And personally, I don't actually feel the effects much of altitude until I get above 17. Um, but it does, you know, the other thing that affects at altitude is you, you lose your appetite. It's difficult to drink stuff and nothing really tastes good once you get up high, um, which is also another, uh, I think, reason to, to climb high and then sleep down low where you're a little bit more adjusted. So does it, just curious on that with the altitude, so you can... Um, get acclimated to it, you know, for yourself, because you've been doing it for so long, but, um, you know, how many times would it have to take for you to just get used to the altitude, like, like you? So when you adjust to altitude, you don't really hang on to it long. So, you know, okay. some of the research will say you hold your altitude for a couple of weeks, which is, you know, why some of the athletes, um, runners, as an example, will train at altitude, um, because when they come back down to sea level or thereabouts, they're much more acclimatized. And what that acclimatization actually does is your body um, gets used to working in, uh, uh, with less oxygen available. So, you know, the, the amount of oxygen that's available is 21%, whether you're here or you're on top of Denali. But the, uh, the barometric pressure is less. And so you have less available oxygen from that perspective. So when you go high and you've been up and you come back down and climbers will talk about getting back into fat air, which means <laughs> there's just more available. And so you feel great and could run you know, a marathon after you come back down. But unfortunately, you only hang on to that acclimatization unless you're, you're Nepalese or you come from an area with high altitude. Um, it, it lasts a couple of weeks and then you're back to your norm again. So genetically, people that live in high altitudes have some physiological changes that make them more adaptable. But most of us or all of us on this list um, don't actually meet that. You know, I, it's, uh, uh, it, it just is uh, one of those things that it's so individual in terms of what your response is going to be. Mm, makes sense. 
Um, let's see. Nancy just wanted to say thank you. A uh, very good overview of Prepper uh, being prepared and risks on Denali. Um, she loved the pictures as well. But also, what do you love about your work on Denali? Um, I think that medically up there, uh, it's sort of ultimate problem solving. Um, there's many aspects to it. It's, you know, I've worked, uh, you know, I, I'm a paramedic. I worked in, in the flight industry as a flight paramedic, critical care flight paramedic. And uh, when I work either on the ground or in the air, I, I, I don't have the independence in terms of decision making that I do when I'm on the mountain. It's one of those things where good, bad, or indifferent, when you get a patient, tag your it, and now you've got to problem solve not only the patient, but also the evacuation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like that a lot. I like that, that problem solving and I, I like to help people. And uh, typically the people I see are pretty darn sick. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really rewarding to help them through that event so that they can you know, head down under their own accord or we can facilitate an evacuation to someone, uh, to a facility that's uh, um, gonna take care of them further. You know, it's, it's funny, but we work with the hospitals in Anchorage and a lot of times I'll ship somebody by helicopter that's in full pulmonary edema. And by the time they get down to the hospital because there's been such a decline in, uh, in altitude that they hit the hospital doors and they're actually doing okay. Mm. And, uh, and uh, so the emergency department uh, folks there understand that in terms of dealing with altitude patients, but it's, uh, it's pretty darn rewarding. I see a question in there from Peter about the backboard. Mm -hmm. So typically, Peter, we don't have backboards on the mountain that we use for spinal motion restriction at all. We use vacuum mattresses. The reason I chose a backboard for this patient was because he was violent and it threatened to harm all of us. And it was the easiest way for me to package him just to, for, for safety for all of us that were involved. You know, curious on my end, just knowing that you you find love in the fact of like problem solving, ha, you know, from certain situations that would happen on Denali or, or elsewhere, you know, has anything happened to you specifically that has made you feel like you knew the answer toward, like for it? Or did you have to, of course, get help? Um, anything like that? I guess I, I guess I've been fortunate, Jane. I really haven't been in a situation. I think that part of our knowledge base going into it and our skill sets knows us or tells us when to back off um, or when we need to change something. Mm -hmm. um, and quite honestly, boy, I would dread the day I would have to call my own search and rescue team to come in and get me if I was in trouble. So mm -hmm. it hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, uh, it, it's one of those things that, that you know, um, I think that as you develop your skill set, you, you learn how to take care of yourself. I think, you know, most of the people that are on this have the ability to travel safely in the back country. And as long as they continue to think things through and make good uh, situ situational awareness decisions, uh, they're going to be safe. Mm. It's all mental, really. Well, yeah, really you know, I... Around. I I, ha I have a friend that uh, that I work a lot with and teach a lot with and asks one of the common questions and he kind of tongue-in-cheek answers when people say, well, what should I take with me? Mm -hmm. um, he said the most important piece of equipment you take into the back country is your brain. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's a yeah. you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's also a true statement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, anywhere too, just if it's, if it's back country, I mean, even for the Appalachian Trail, I think people in my own experience just didn't know when to stop or were injured and thought they could continue on, but, but couldn't. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you one situation where um, that was a decision-making situation. Dude, Tim and I, my friend Tim and I were on a climb on Denali and we arrived at about 9,800 feet where we were going to camp. And I have an altimeter on my watch and I was watching as we stood still, the altimeter continue to climb, mm -hmm. which means that the barometric pressure is, is going down. So mm -hmm. as most of us or all of us know, when we have a low barometric pressure system is that uh, brings in bad weather. Mm -hmm. So we had started our climb and we ended up in this huge storm 
that uh, took seven days before the storm actually ended. Wow. And um, we ended up staying nine days in the same spot um, because after all of that snow that we had, then the avalanche risk was so, uh, was so significant that we couldn't travel. And we actually, at one point, the winds were so high that we were in our sleeping, in our sleeping bags inside our tent with fully dressed with our shovels across their chest because if our tent ended up going away in the storm, we were going to have to dig and go underground and, and spend the night in a snow cave. I guess yeah. that's the closest thing, but it wasn't really a self-rescue thing. It's we had the skills to do what we needed to do, but it was darn scary in there with the way the winds were flying around. Yeah, I bet. Mm. Um, here, Marty um, asked, um, do you evacuate bodies that are recovered from accidents or disasters? Yeah, you know, and it's not something that I put into the talk, but uh, Denali has two or three deaths per year on average. The worst year that I, I had with deaths was uh, a few years ago. There were five that uh, died during the climbing season, uh, three of them in an avalanche, and the avalanche swept them down and deposited them in a crevasse. So, yep, we do. And there was actually a slide in there, which I didn't feel necessary to point out, of a body recovery off of Mount Beryl. Um, where two climbers were swept in an avalanche and we got flown off at Denali to go into a different part of the range and look for them. Um, and we did find them. Um, snow conditions were so, so unstable for us to even do the rescue that we waited uh, almost two days to uh, do a body recovery by helicopter. So yeah, it's unfortunate it happens. Um, for a lot of reasons, cardiac arrest uh, for some folks on a guided climb is one that I've worked with and, and avalanche tends to be a big one. Um, you know, it, it, if you think of, you know, a major trauma from a fall, even on Mount Washington, it's gonna take a while for rescuers to get there mm -hmm. and then take even longer to be able to, uh, you know, evacuate that person to a hospital. So it's an unfortunate part of the game, but it's something that is part of the game. Mm -hmm. Is there certain tools or anything like if it's if it's like an avalanche, you know, it may be hard to find, you know, certain people that are missed um, that are missing. Um, is there anything or. So, yeah, we use avalanche beacons, which probably people are familiar with. Um, you know, there's no way to really fly dogs in there, although we did have an avalanche um, in the lower part of the mountain that uh, some climbers from Japan were injured and just happened to have one of the women uh, that's a ranger there happened to have her dog with her who's an avalanche trained dog so we flew the dog in and unfortunately these guys were buried so deep that the dog didn't even alert there is so i and what i was going to say and i hesitated is and so those bodies are still there okay um peter i guess uh mentioned just that um uh, a couple of good books um, by someone named Ty Gagney about decision making while hiking in the White Mountains. Um, do you have any recommended books as well? Or, you know, I haven't heard of that one there, but um, yeah, I, I, it's important. Yeah, it, it is important. I think that there's, there's a, a bunch of different things out there. I don't have one that I sort of say this is my go to with it. But, you know, it, it, Peter's right. It, it's figuring out that decision making is actually the the, uh, the key to this. And that goes back to sort of bringing your brain with you as the most important piece of, uh, of equipment. Mm -hmm. I think he recommended another book where you'll find me in the last traverse. Oh, maybe for him. <laughs> so, you, you know, another resource that talks a little bit about decision-making is there's a book called Medicine for Mountaineering. Um, I can't remember the author's name right now, but it uh, also talks about decision in the backcountry decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you um, also, you know, I feel as if you probably hike many other mountains too. Is Denali one of those favorites for you or is there something else you could think of? Um, well, I, 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 you know, I've spent, major portion of my life climbing. And so, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough. I worked on Kilimanjaro for five years as a guide. Um, 
off and on, you know, in East Africa, you have two rainy seasons, the long rains and the short rains, and you climb in between those. So I've, I've gone over there and guided there. I've also guided in the Himalayas, which I really enjoy, but I'm not sure why, but Alaska has a special place in my heart. Um, and it's just, uh, the Alaska range is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Mm. Oh, nice. Haven't been to Alaska, but would like to. Well, let me know when you go. Had... I'll tell you. Let me know when you go. I'll tell you where the best pizza and beer is. I can. I, okay. <laughs> no. Well, guys, uh, if there's any other questions, you know, you can feel free. Um, we've been on for almost about an hour and a half, so we might be closing up for the talk and Paul if you have any other things to say or no just if there's any other questions please email me I'm happy to to talk to you I, I really enjoy this stuff as I hope you can tell so I'm happy to continue a conversation on uh, offline awesome all right guys well Paul thank you again I, I mean it's it's fun to just learn of an area that not many people know of and um, it makes you feel even more encouraged to experience something like that but also know all the medical um, you know steps that need to be done and to feel like you're prepared you know mentally and knowing that you have to make the right decision too and um, really do appreciate it and for everyone else also um, Again, my name is Jane Trailer with Hanover Adventure Tours, and this is one of our adventure talk series. We are recording this, so we'll be placing this on YouTube. And when we send off an email, we'll send a thank you email, and that will have um, Paul's email, if that's okay, as well as um, just some information about where this uh, recorded video will be. And there'll be a bunch more coming our way. And uh, we thank everyone for joining us, and especially you, Paul. Thanks, Jane, and thanks everybody for uh, for coming to watch me talk. Awesome. Have a great rest of your night. Night, everybody. Night. Bye.